And we have a very exciting session coming up titled The Poetics of Pain. And I will turn it immediately over to Desmond Williams to kick it off. Over to you, Desmond. Welcome, everybody, to uh, a session that I am very, very excited to be a part of. So today I am here to introduce uh, somebody that is a, a teacher of mine, somebody I've had the pleasure of being in the classroom with for many, many hours a couple of years ago, and uh, it was a very formative experience for me. So today I'm here to introduce, and it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce Vanessa Richards here for the Poetics of Pain. And so po uh, Vanessa Richards is a transdisciplinary artist and facilitator with a passion for communities, collaboration, and culture. She initiates art-based social projects that move us towards life-affirming change. At Simon Fraser University, she's an associate of the SFU Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue, an instructor in the Community Capacity Building Certificate, which I had the pleasure of being a part of for number one uh, cohort and has been an advisor in the Radius Fellowship at the Beatles School of Business. She was a song leader and founder of the Woodward's Community Singers Drop-In Choir for 11 years until the current pandemic. And she wants you to know that she believes in you. So I would like to hand it off to Vanessa Richards for the Poetics of Pain. Thank you so much, Desmond. It is um, a delight to work with you today. And Yasser, also a delight to be with you and your whole Pain BC team. Also, if Maria Hudspeth is in the room, the virtual room, I'd like to extend a warm hello to you as well, Maria, and your family. So this is also an invitation if you would get a pen and paper ready or any kind of device you might like to use if it's available to you to make some notes, to make a mark or two. And if it's close at hand, now's the time to grab it. My intention for you today is that you would find something useful in this poetic exploration of pain. And I'm going to offer some bombs. This is also my first time using a two screen thing, feeling kind of sophisticated. So if you see me turning away, you get the profile. I'm, I'm looking at my notes, which is also pretty exciting for me. So thanks for being first time I get to try this two screenedness. So I'm interested in bombs, the bomb of movement, of poetry, of music, and that we might locate more bombs to soothe what ails. And it's said that what we pay attention to grows. And I give you my finest riches when I pay you with my attention. So thank you for offering me your fine riches as you pay attention to the, what we have to offer today. And what we have to offer is what Federico Lorca said, the poem, the song, the picture is only water drawn from the well of the people. And it should be given back to them in a cup of beauty so that they may drink and in drinking, understand themselves, Lorca. So this idea of observational acuity. I just love to say that. You could say that too if you wanted to. It feels really good on the tongue. Observational acuity. Otherwise called paying attention. It's a choice muscle. And I would like to quote another poet, Auden, W.H. Auden, who says this about choice. Choice of attention. To pay attention to this and ignore that is to the inner life what choice of action is to the outer. In both cases, a person is responsible for their choice and must accept the consequences, whatever they may be. Choice of attention, pay attention to this and ignore that, is to the inner life what choice of action is to the outer. In both cases, a person is responsible for his choice and must accept the consequences, whatever they may be. My intention, today is that the consequences be delight. So to test my theory, 
let's let's register current levels of delight. Consider your physical. Is there any areas of delight? Consider your mental. Are there any areas of delight? What about that old nugget, the emotional? Are there any areas of delight currently activated within you? And if you could locate them, could you rate them on a scale from one to 23? One being like just the barest whisper, like when you see a 12 year old starting to get their mustache and you're not really sure if it's there. Um, and 23 being like full radiance. So if you could register your level of delights in these three areas, and if you feel like sharing them, you could put those in the chat. Otherwise, just keep them for yourself because we're gonna return to this. So I've been inspired by this idea of delight. I actually was living a life of delight in many ways. And I found a, found a poet and essayist called Ross Gay who really helped me find some language for this feeling of ebullience that I admit I've kind of been lucky to be born with and I've done a lot of hard work to maintain it. And I think it's actually a transferable skill. I'm hoping those of you that have a, require, um, those of you that have an interest might skill up with me today. So I wanted to tell you that this is a work of Roske, this idea of like clocking delight. And I started to register, when I started to read his work, I started to register delights in a much more conscientious way than I had before I read his book of delights, which is the title. So for one year, Ross Gay practiced noticing delights, large or small, and by hand, he wrote about them each day, just one page, one page of delights that he noticed by hand. And so to create a deeper embodiment, each time a delight was experienced, he would pause, raise his finger and go, ah, delight. So I invite you to consider this gesture with me if you even want to try it right now. Just raise a finger. Ah, delight. And it's in this pausing and this noting that it actually expands. So this is what Gay had to say about his work. It didn't take me long to learn that the discipline or practice of writing these essays occasioned a kind of delight radar. Or maybe it was more like the development of a delight muscle, something that implies that the more you study delight, the more delight there is to study. I felt my life to be more full of delight, not without sorrow or fear, or pain, or loss, but more full of delight. I also learned this year that my delight grows, much like love and joy when I share it. Ah, delight. So I invite you to offer your friends and colleagues here one of your delights in the realm of the physical, mental, or the emotional. And if you've rated it 1 to 23, let's See if we can get a look at that in the chat. Thank you. So now that you know the framework, let us begin. I'm gonna invite you to take a look at this work of art by the artist Wes Harmon. They're uh, from Prince George. Carrier with the Nation, 1990. They were born in 1990. They're currently the curator of the Grant Gallery in Vancouver. I invite you to take a look, spend some time with that. Try and decipher it with you. This work can be awkward, maybe a little obtuse. And if you can read it, thank you for the effort. If you said, oh, I'm just gonna wait for Vanessa to tell me what it says and just like kick back and relaxed, that's also cool. And the invitation is this, this is what the painting asks us. No more than the names of the land, we are past the point of gratitude. 
it is time to commit to more than live, work, and play. No more than the names of the land. We are past the point of gratitude. It is time to commit to more than live, work, and play on the territories where you live. I live and am held and nourished by the lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And one of the one of the ways that I would like to accept my responsibilities as a newcomer here is that it's time for me to learn from the land too. And I wonder what's possible. What's possible for each of us if we deepen our understanding of the invitation. And in my case, from the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people, and certainly the diaspora of indigenous folks from across Turtle Island that live in our region. The teaching is always the same. Learn from the land. So I've outlined a few ways that we can do that through poetry, movement, and music. So this first one is movement with breath, hands, and birds. I'm gonna invite you to make yourself comfortable wherever you're located. If you're standing or laying down or sitting or someplace in between, maybe moving all between those. And to invite your breath, I know some of you have done the yoga this morning and that looked wonderful. Thank you, Des, and your team for demonstrating how to bring so much peace to the body. And I'm going to invite you to breathe freely, but deeply, kind of like that feeling, if you can remember that feeling after exertion, but while the endorphins are still there. And that the breath settles deep into all parts of your body. Just see if you can locate that kind of breathing for the moment. And then as you watch this video, it's going to be five minutes long. Whoa. So you can relax into it. And I'm going to invite you to just notice your breathing. Try keeping it moving. Feel if you can mirror some of the movements you'll see. And then also how your hands might also mirror the movement. We're gonna bring a little bit of motion in, even if it's just one finger, just see if you can keep your hands responsive. It could mirror or it can just be in response to what you're seeing. And what you're gonna see is birds gathering and murmurations. And this is in um, an open field in Holland. The Wildlife and Wetlands Trust, the WWT has this to say, that's a wetlands conservation organization, I think the oldest one in the UK. They have this to say about murmurations, that birds gather for, birds gather murmurations for a variety of reasons. Grouping together offers safety in numbers as predators like peregrine falcons find it hard to target one bird in amongst a hypnotizing flock of thousands. Starlings, these are starlings that we'll be witnessing, also gather to keep warm at night and exchange information about good feeding areas. They often perform their aerial acrobatics over their roosting site as they gather together for the night. And in particular, these, um, these murmurations are seen in these autumn and winter months. So you can keep your eyes on the skies on the humble, brilliant starling, which was introduced to North America by a group of Shakespeare lovers who wanted to put every animal mentioned in Shakespeare into a park in New York City. And I think we went from something like 60 starlings to millions of starlings now all over North America. I think they're kind of an underrated and beautiful bird. And um, let us begin. Music will get more pronounced as we go through. So breathing. If 
you can stay in motion with the birds at your patient place. Hmm. Felt nice. Hope you enjoyed that too. A way to dance with the land, the birds of the land, us being the human animals of the land. There's something else that the land does hums, chirps things all right so i'm going to read this to you and then i'm going to speak to you a little bit about the science very little bit about the science of humming and then we'll do some humming together 
This is by the poet and I think he's an interfaith Buddhist pastor, teacher, Fred Lamote. Fred says, and don't forget to hum. That too will strengthen your immune system. You don't have to chant om, just hum. A gentle hum stimulates your vagus nerve, that tree of life in the center of the garden of your body, all the way down your back. The burning bush of neurological fire that Moses saw in the cloud of unknowing on Mount Horeb, from whose flames the voice of the formless resonated 10 Sephiroths, world-shaping angels, usually mistaken as commandments by humless intellects trapped in a fruitless tangle of words, which is that other tree, the tree of opposites, the knowledge of good and evil. Forget all of that. Forget all of that and just hum your hum. If you let it, your hum, if you let it, if you let it, sinks down and connects to the holy name, the mantra, the river of sound that sang the galaxies from silence. Your hum is the song of Ramari, the bee goddess. Let it vibrate through your skull, soothing your hypothalamus, opening the almond fragrance opening the almond fragrance of your amygdala, lighting the chandelier of your pituitary in the ballroom at the center of your brain, lighting the chandelier of your pituitary in the ballroom at the center of your brain, polishing the blue pineal pearl whose arrow of shakti will open the eye in your forehead. Let all your cells make golden honey of the hum, dripping down the back of your throat into the cavernous temple of your chest, flowing into the grail that sits on the altar of your breastbone. Hum stars through your belly button. Hum sap through your root. Hum yoni, hum balls, hum moonlight into your seeds. Hum down the amphibian caverns of the earth where unborn sons sleep. Hum. This hum that we're about to make is breath music. And this slow paced humming causes both our blood pressure to be significantly decreased as well as decrease in heart rate. Thus it promotes relaxation and reduces stress. And also the hormones associated with stress such as cortisol. And research has shown that not only is a hum self-soothing, it affects us on a physical level as well as lowering our heart rate and our blood pressure and powerful neurochemicals such as oxytocin, the love chemical. Humming does three important things. It greatly increases nasal nitric oxide. You gotta get a load of this. Nasic ni nasal nitric oxide, this is what it does. It's a neural transmitter that is released as a gas to sterilize the air you breathe. Your body is sterilizing the air you breathe when you hum, sterilizing airborne pathogens. Nitric oxide, oxide also increases arterial oxygenation. <sighs> also, humming will stimulate your vagus nerve as we've discussed earlier. And this plays a key role in our parasympathetic nervous system known as otherwise our rest and digest runs from our larynx to our parents and our throat creates this stimulating sound that um, increases the nerve. Humming can also improve our heart rate, our heart rate variability. And so what I wanna do with you is a call and response hum. So in our own time, we're gonna 
just hum a little together. If you want to do call and response with me, I invite you to do that. I'll hum a little and then I'll go like that, which is your invitation to repeat the hum. I'll do the same hum again. Or you can just turn down the volume and hum yourself in your own beautiful way. We'll do that for a few moments, for a few minutes as well. So I'm going to invite you just to touch your jaw and allow like a, a pencil between your teeth. What would be like a pencil space between your teeth? And softly close your lips with your jaw still relaxed. If you can imagine the roof of your mound, the, the roof inside your head being lifted like in a yawn. And then just play around with all the different sensations. I'm gonna invite you also to put your hands on your face, on your neck, and just sort of feel the vibration as we begin. We're beginning now. And you can do this with your mic turned off. Cross your hands in front of you. Just place a hand on each cheek. And we'll do one long hum together. Just feel for the feeling in your fingertips and offer your body a gentle rock as you hum now. Sustaining that hum. Hum. power. I'd like to now look at poetry and consider it dancing language in this idea if we're looking at movement, music, and uh, sound. Let's look at some dancing poetry, shall we? So this is one of those good old fashioned poems. 
with the lark. This is by the great Paul Lawrence Dunbar, one of the more remembered and well cited poets of the Harlem Renaissance. Night is for sorrow and dawn is for joy, chasing the troubles that fret and annoy. Darkness for sighing and daylight for song, cheery and chaste the strain, heartfelt and strong. All the night through, though I moan in the dark, I wake in the morning to sing with the lark or dance with the starlings. I wake in the morning to sing with the lark. Deep in the midnight, the rain whips the leaves. Softly and sadly, the wood spirit grieves. But when the first hue of dawn tints the sky, I shall shake out my wings like the birds and be dry. And though like the raindrops, I grieved through the dark, I shall wake in the morning to sing with the lark. On the high hills of heaven, some morning to be, where the rain shall not grieve through the leaves of the tree, there my heart will be glad for the pain I have known, for my hand will be clasped in the hand of mine own. And though life has been hard and death's pathways been dark, I shall wake in the morning to sing with the lark. I invite you to read this in your own time, in your own mind, and see if there's a line that speaks to you. And if so, maybe you could write it down. You could write it down to keep for yourself or write it down in the chat to share with the others something that resonated with you in this poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar from the Harlem Renaissance, which was probably like 1918 to the early 1930s, one of the most important um, Black arts movements, considered one of the first ones in the 20th century. Significant. Is there a line that speaks to you in this poem? Or a word even? Let's review it with your own eyes. Notice what might spark a feeling of delight. You saw the formations, the hearts, the animals. Yeah, I really felt that one too, Courtney, for my hand will be clasped in the hand of mine own. Yeah, like holding your own hand, not as mm, this illusion of aloneness and without company, but then the oneness that this circle could create and being one with the nature. There my heart will be glad for the pain I have known for my hand will be clasped in the hand of mine own. Yeah, thank you for sharing those with me. Hey, let's get into the next one. This is late prayer. So, Des, would you like to read this one? I think you've read this one with me before. This is the work of my friend, Erin Robinson, who was raised on Cortez Island off the west coast of British Columbia, which is the homelands of the Kluhus, Klamen, and the um, Homolko. She was raised on a piece of land there where the Hollyhock Leadership Institute is, which is a place I have the pleasure of working in quite often. And so I think about this as a poem from this place. Des, would you like to read? Sure. Thank you. I would love to. All right. So um, I guess we will get in right to it. Late Prayer by Aaron Robinson. May our weapons be effective feminine inventions that like life. May we blow up like weeds and be medicinal and everywhere. May the disturbed ground be our pharmacy. May the exhausted hang out in the beautiful light. 
May our souls moisten and reveal us. May our actions be deft as the inhale after a dream of suffocation. May the oligarchs get enough to eat in their souls. May we participate in the intelligence we are in. May we grow into our name. May political harm be a stench that awakens. May we not be distracted. Let our joy repeated be power that spreads. Let our joy repeated be power that spreads. May our wealth be common. May oligarchs come out of their fortresses and become psychologically well. May their wealth be returned to the people and the places. May we shift, slide, rise, tilt, roll and twist. May we feel the May we feel the very large intimacy and may it assist us. Thank you, Des. It's a great pleasure to hear friends read poetry to each other. Again, is there a line or a word or an idea in this poem that reminds you of a way we can learn from the land. Is there a line or a word in this poem that reminds you, that points you to a way you can learn from the land? May we feel the very large intimacy, 100% carry in. May we blow up like weeds and be medicinal and everywhere. I've heard it said that this, and I think it's called the kudzu plant, the kudzu plant, the Japanese kudzu plant that is a seeming like a invasive species right now, uh, that said that it also carries medicine for Lyme's disease. Plantain, um, some of you have read Robin Wall Kimmerer. She calls that. Well, not she, but the Potawatomi people called it white man's footsteps because it came with them and traveled with them and kept showing up everywhere. And at first they were like, what is this plant that is spreading everywhere? And then they discovered, oh, it can be used as a poultice for wounds and so many other good medicinal uses. Yeah, I love this one too, Melanie. May our weapons be effective feminine inventions that like life. What? Next poem, please. Trough, more lessons from the land. Des, can you read this one as well, please? Thank you. It sounded so beautiful as you read that one. This is by Jody Soren Brown, contemporary writer as well. I would love to. All right. Um, so let's get right into it once again. Trough by Judy Soren Brown. There is a trough in waves, a low spot, where horizon disappears and only sky and water are our company. And there we lose our way unless we rest, knowing the wave will bring us to its crest again. There we may drown if we let fear hold us within its grip and shake us side to side and leave us flailing, torn, disoriented. But if we rest there in the trough, are silent, being with the low part of the wave, keeping our energy and noticing the shape of things. 
the flow. Then time alone will bring us to another place where we can see horizon, see the land again, regain our sense of where we are and where we need to swim. Noticing, 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 noticing the shape of things, the flow, then time alone will bring us to another place where we can see horizon, see the land again, regain our sense of where we are and where we need to swim. Anything available for you in these words by Judy Soren Brown. She's out of Boulder, Colorado. She does a lot of work around leadership and um, healing communities, intentional communities around healing body, mind, and spirit. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Then time alone will bring us, time alone will bring us to another place. Yeah, the repeating pattern is predictable, giving us a sense of control where it does not seem to be. Yeah. It's like a wave in a moment, that pattern repeats for a while. And then it's kind of like the humming we just did. I would repeat some things and other things and return to others. That's also like murmurations. Last poem. I shall read this one. This is by the Jamaican American poet, Lucille Clifton. More lessons from the land and the waters, blessing the boats at St. Mary's. May the tide that is entering even now, may the tide that is entering even now, the lip of our understanding carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind, then turn from it, certain that it will love your back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever, and may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. Some of you will recognize the Irish blessing that's embedded in here. May the, I think it's something like, may the wind be at your back and that was something for the sailors there too right yeah the Irish have been all over the world and influenced so many of us may the tide that is entering even now the lip of our understanding carry you out beyond the face of fear may you kiss the wind then turn from it certain that it will love your back may you open your eyes to water water waving forever. And may you in your innocence sail through this to that. Same, you know what to do here, friends. Is there something in there for you? A lesson, a way of learning from the land, a land in the waters. Landlings. Or from the landlings, new word for earthlings. <laughs> that tells me it's time to move to the next dance. Okay, so this is what we're going to do to close, friends. Dancing is poetry in motion. That's right. Oh, I got to tell you quickly about that. So culture will have us afraid to dance while people are watching, you know, so like dance, like nobody's watching. Are you joking me? I want to watch you dance. This is like one of the delights of human life. All of our ancestors did it. Yes, they did it in the dark by candlelight or by fire, but we also did it in the daytime to take joy in each other. It tried to, so the culture we're in currently tried to convince us that the medicine of dancing is frivolous or only available to those of us who do it well. Well, what about when it makes us feel well? What about when it makes us feel well? Do some of us get permission while others get denied access to the delights of the body in motion? So this is, again, 
thinking about Ross Gay, he has this term called soul gestures when the body is moving, soul gestures. And he says this, maybe not about dancing, but about being touched, being touched by the music and being touched and moved physically, your body being touched. Um, and since we're playing with this idea of poetry in motion, let's consider that he also means dancing when Ross Gay says, in witnessing someone being touched, we're also witnessing someone being moved, the absence of which in ourselves is a sorrow and a sacrifice. In witnessing the absence of movement in ourselves by witnessing its abundance in another can hurt. So like if I'm watching you dance and I feel like, oh, no, I can't, that hurts, right? We don't want that. So until it becomes, oh, I've got to start this part again. So in witnessing the absence of movement in ourselves by witnessing its abundance in another can hurt until it becomes, if we are lucky, an opening. So the opening is a powerful vision to move towards. This opening is a blooming, beautiful human bloom flowering and dancing. And so this vision of us as a garden in bloom, I want to close my quotes with Audre Lorde, who said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid, says Audre Lorde, the great feminist, Black poet, thinker, and philosopher, shaper of worlds. And I'm going to take you to this one moment, friends. This is the last thing. How are we doing for time? Okay, come on. This is a track from 1958. It was, uh, you'll hear it, it's scratchy because it's on a 78. 78 RPM came out in 1968 on um, uh, his master's voice, HMV, HMV Records. Remember the dog looking at the gramophone? And this came from South Africa, this music, and they're called um, the African Swingsters. So at this time, South Africa had to have a revolutionary vision of what their innate beauty and worthiness and eventual liberation could look like. They had to have a vision. And the delight of, a, of dance was a bomb and a fuel for this vision. And so in that, with that in mind, so the African Swingsters, the song is called She Utashane. And this was made during apartheid, which literally in Afrikaans translates to separate, separateness or literally aparthood. And it was a system of, as you know, institutionalized, racialized segregation. And it existed in South Africa and Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia, from 1948 to early 1990s when Nelson Mandela was sworn in as the president of South Africa. But I got to tell you one more good thing about this. It's not good, but it's interesting word. Um, apartheid was characterized by an authoritarian, authoritarian political culture based on baskap literally boss ship or boss hood, which is why when you see um, historic videos of South Africa, they will call um, native indigenous Africans of South Africa would call the colonizers boss because that was their philosophical framework, boss cop. So inside of all of that pain, there was still dancing, flowers and bloom. So I'm gonna invite you if you will, to get up or sit down or do whatever you like. Two minutes, 48 seconds. Shoulder. Hands, any place you like. I'm gonna be on my knee behind those shoes.
Okay, that was <laughs> a delight. Now friends, oopsie doopsie, going back. I would now like you to register, <sighs> rate your levels of delight. Oh, I'm sorry, darn it. Okay, I'm touching the wrong things here. So please consider your physical, mental, and emotional levels of delight. Delight, boss. That was from Fantasy Island. Okay. Anybody see an increase? If you've had an increase, give me like a, some kind of hallelujah or emoji in the chat so I can see you. Yeah. Went up five points. That's so cool, Carrie. 21, 21, 21. Great. So with that, I thank you for your precious time. We are now open for a few moments of question and answers, comments, feedback, anything you would like to say or offer to the group or questions to me. Reflections on the power of poetry, movement, and music as a tool for the poetics of pain. I'm going to stop share. Great. Now I can see my ridiculous face. What's been happening here? Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, that was a joy to be back in your classroom again. Um, yes, I'm, I'm so grateful for everything. And so we do have uh, just over five minutes for some Q&A. Um, and so the first question that I've seen come up from Deborah is, uh, do you have any upcoming workshops? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, not exactly. Maybe Des, um, I'll put in the link to, I also put it in my uh, profile on the line here to our class, a community capacity building certificate program at SFU. Applications for that are opening in uh, like any day now. And that's for any kinds of all different kinds of community workers. So like Des came in with his community practice and we have people particularly interested in those that haven't had formal education meeting and working alongside people who have had formal education and want to unlearn. And so we choose this group of about 35 people from a pretty big pool, how they might um, learn from each other. And we do things like this there, though I don't usually get 45 minutes just to nerd out on poetry, but it is a part of every class yes and so um yeah if, if you do want to uh, explore a little more time with vanessa you uh you also would get the chance to be a uh, part of the community capacity building program and that's a few that is um really just a very uh heart opening and expansive and formative experience um for any and everybody so i would definitely highly recommend uh looking into that if you uh, were interested because it's not just Vanessa there are a couple of other instructors as well and um, it's just uh, such a, a beautiful interesting experience so and there's no cost to participate yes free 99 uh, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and just like today's conference um, what a beautiful way to access things um, not out of your pocket um, so Vanessa, there are a couple more comments um, here as well that I just wanted to share with you uh, from Courtney uh, that their takeaway was, we do not need to wait for joy to just happen. We have power over joy. And, um, you know, I thought you would really love to hear that. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a keeper. That is exactly uh, that's like a dream come true for me to hear you say that because you already knew that. So you're just reminding yourself and you're reminding the rest of us like that to me is like the biggest power we have. One of the biggest powers we have because culture will tell you that you need to have this outfit or this situation or this, all the different things. And really you just need to be able to sit down with your people and share some poems or read them for yourself or make them yourself or let your own body hum to hum with another, right? Watch the sky, watch the, watch the water. And oh, wow, all of a sudden things start to get magnificent. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for that. 
Right. It, it really is such a powerful thing to recognize certain just little moments like that. And a couple other comments that we have here uh, from Carrie Ann Burgess, such a great reminder to take time to enjoy things we may take for granted or just forget to do. Music, dance, humming, movement in the body that is pleasurable. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, thank you. And you know, especially like, you know, when your pain disappears and you're like, oh, oh, I forgot um, this other thing that I've enjoyed. Or maybe you know, just notice, oh, I really like this apple because it's autumn time and you forgot how good it tastes because now you're, you know, maybe you've got arthritis or something and your hand isn't hurting and the apple tastes good. So like that, that, that observational acuity, that practice of paying attention offers so much. And that book of delights by Ross Gay is a great read. We have one more comment here as well uh, that just says from Maria, our, our wonderful Maria Hudspeth. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Big gratitude to you. Uh, still remembering you led us in singing in the round as part of the 2017 Provincial Pain Summit in BC. It is such powerful medicine uh, to get us thinking about all the ways to elevate joy and reduce pain. So thank you, Vanessa. Um, and yeah, it, it is just, it was a pleasure and a joy to have you here today uh, to get to read some poetry with you and um, to, you know, just get to be in your presence once again, as it always uh, is something that is uh, helpful and positive. And like you'd mentioned, sometimes when you are able to be present in an experience, it can take some of your focus or attention away from uh, what is bothering us because we tune into the things that we enjoy and that give us joy and comfort and pleasure. And so uh, yeah. to me, this is just such a beautiful offering um, for people to reconnect and be re-inspired to do those little simple things that uh, come from within us uh, to help us with our pain. So thank you so much, Vanessa. Yeah, thank you, Des. And thank you, Des and team and Yasser and Maria and your whole team have been wonderful to work with. And I wish everybody, you know, continued, um, continued endurance and delight as you make the work of pain. Um, really, it's, a, it's such an impressive, impressive work that everybody's doing around the helping everybody else understand pain too. So that's so, so appreciated. And I'm hopeful to see you in the good days ahead. And also, Deborah says, may others give to you as you give to others. So that's a great place to finish. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Vanessa. And I will hand it back to Chris for our final remarks for the day. Wow. Thank you, Vanessa and Desmond, uh, for an incredibly inspiring session. It registered a full 23 on my scale of delight. It was just beautiful. Um, and thanks to all of you who attended and, and participated in today's sessions.